The five big trends that we discovered when it comes to managing social and environmental performance are the following. Uh, the big trend number one, when it comes to social and environmental performance, we're moving away from this being an issue of a moral choice to becoming an inevitable reality. You may like it or not, you may believe it or not, you may agree that there's climate change or not, you have no more option. So if before it was a kind of, you know, morality for dummies kind of conversation, can we give you a flashback? Now it's simply what defines your ability to create value. And as I said, these are the three big things that for different industries shape up in a different way. But if you're a company producing a product, for example, this wonderful chair, you have new definition of reality that you simply cannot avoid anymore. For some companies, it's declining resources, so you as a producer of this chair are facing such a volatility with the raw material supply or transportation cost that you simply cannot ignore it anymore. Or you as a company producing a chair and it's produced using unfair practices, child labor, um, every other kind of problem, and now big Nonprofits are really putting you as a kind of scapegoat child of everything that is wrong with capitalism, so you have to change. Or there's a pressure from consumers, but not just consumers. Now your investors are also saying, we would like you to exist in 20 years, so please change the way you practice. As now many pension funds became big pushers in sustainability, saying that our clients will use our services in 30 years when they retire. In 30 years, we would like your company still to exist here, otherwise we will not invest in your company. So it becomes a big push, but it's three big trends in terms of declining resources, radical transparency, including expectations that suddenly push social environmental pressures into the core of business and value creation. Now, the second trend, moving from greener and socially responsible products to simply smart products. If before we were talking about premium pricing or bad performance, but this is green. So come to the supermarket, you can of course buy uh, organic bio butter, but it will be two times more expensive. Now consumers and the society at large says, no, this is just a normal business. We don't want green, we want smart. And for that, I want to give you a little test. Um, if you think about, for example, as a little illustration, before as a company, a company that produced, let's say, computing, computers were meant to be as a product. This is a product, and I can make it a little bit greener. For example, instead of plastic right here, I can use cardboard, and we now have computers with cardboard that are actually very, very functionally well. But if we think about this as a computer, it's natural for me as a company to want to sell you as many computers as possible, therefore I will make more money. Now, if I think from the computers to computing and say that I'm not selling you computers, I'm selling you computing, I don't need to push you products anymore, I don't need to push you plastic. We're moving, to, for example, to cloud computing where you will not need any hardware and any software, where all of your services will be plugged in the way we get electricity from the wall right now, and there will be one total big server per some region. We're now seeing some big servers coming up in Ireland and other places. For example, Microsoft is in Ireland, where all of your computing happens through the hole in the wall and you don't need to waste plastic, invest as your company and therefore it changes the game. And in that sense, uh, uh, test for you, let's test your sustainability eye. If you think about product, green product versus smart service, what do you think this is? And if it's helpful to think what is the size of this, it's about this big, so it would be fitting into the palm of my hand. So what do you think this is? Any answer is a good answer. So far I've done this with hundreds and hundreds of people and I never got the right answer. So, any answer is a good answer. Is it food? It might be food. No, it's not food. It, it would literally, um, usually I bring it with me this time around, I didn't, but it would really fit into the palm of my hand. It's this thick and it's that green. Mobile phone, no it is, but good idea. Say it again. A plant, no it's not a plant, a radio, that's something new, no it's not a radio. Computer? A computer, it's very small, so it's this big, green. Usually I get answers like uh, a spinach hamburger, uh, pressed, self, uh, 
press pressed um, t-shirt you know how they package t-shirts um, toilet cleaners and so on no it's not in front of you is a shampoo it's a dry shampoo that is equivalent to uh, three 250 milliliters bottles it doesn't use any plastic uh, it doesn't use any packages it's sold in bulk and it requires 15 times less transportation than traditional shampoo it performs as well as other shampoos it costs no more to produce we're moving from green products to smart solutions because this is a solution not only to the end customer but for the entire system if you're selling this shampoo you need much less shelf space than any other shampoo on the market if you're buying this shampoo you will have benefits of different kind if you're producing this shampoo you're saving on transportation plastic uh, labor um, manufacturing process and so on we are moving away, so this trend number two, away from green products that cost more to smart solutions that in most cases are actually cheaper. Now, trend number three, from optional niche to key strategy. It used to be a little thing you do with one product to school look cooler. So as a Ford company, you have a normal lineup of cars and then you have this one weird one for those few that would like the weird green car. And now it's suddenly becoming no so much the short, short, small niche, but very, very big, big opportunity for a strategy. I know Matthew was talking yesterday about Walmart. I don't need to repeat myself there, but there are major, major changes. Aside from Walmart, the company you probably know most well is General Electric. And the eco-imagination work completely changed their core strategy. They actually decided that the world problems will be their next business, their next playground. And their entire lineup of products is now in thousands. It's remarkable what they've done with their product. Now, as a fourth trend, we're moving away from department to mindset. It's no longer that we're just hiring a scapegoat person who will be my sustainability manager or social responsibility manager. And I thought this was cool. <clears throat> a take a charge guy would be nice, but I'm looking for more like of take the blame type. And I think that was very often the case with social responsibility managers, not to offend any one of you, but this is our department, so are you social responsible? Yes, we have a director of responsibility, great. But we're moving away from that to developing really a mindset where everything that we do becomes a different way of looking at things. So when I look at the product, when I look at the process, when I look at my decision making, I'm seeing different things. And it's a different way of understanding and managing your value creation. And then to the five, the biggest trend, I think the most remarkable trend from company to a system. If before my company was my fortress, there are my boundaries. Suddenly there's no more boundaries anymore. Because my social responsibility, my social environmental performance, the biggest impact I have most of the time happens outside of the boundary of my own company. We worked with a potato chips company once. And they had a lot of issues with, of course, environmental footprint. And we were measuring, for example, the overall for environmental footprint in terms of carbon intensity and so on. When they did the value chain analysis, starting with the growing of the potatoes and then processing the potatoes and then transporting the potatoes and then processing in the plant and then packaging and then transporting and selling and consuming, we asked them, where do you think is your biggest footprint? The first thing they thought is transportation, the second is packaging. When you do the actual analysis, what you discover is 60 to 70 percent happens before packaging even starts. So they say, why? Why in the world that happens? When we went to really understand their value chain, we went also to the farmers and what we discovered is that farmers were soaking potatoes in water so they can sell it for much higher quantities. So if you soak your potato in water, it's 20% heavier, so you get 20% more money for what you sold. And potato chips as a product just happens to be dehydrated water. So as a company, you're burning gas like crazy trying to dry up that wet potato. So instead of thinking of your company as a boundary, how do I manage sustainability of social environmental performance in the whole value chain? That's a whole different ballgame. And now we're seeing solutions like this. SourceMap.org will actually, without you having any rights to influence, this is, this is a wiki model, to this source map will source 
every step in your value chain. So is IKEA, this is IKEA example here. Sultan Al Sarbet, it will tell you what is it made of and where it comes from and how much CO2 footprint that is. And you have no right to change that because it's a wiki model. So anybody can post and leak your information. So here it is, a made of HDF, China, two kilos, 30 kilos of CO2. Particle board from Beijing, China, 10 kilos, 37 kilos of CO2. Plywood indoor from Poland, wood pitch pine from Russian Federation and cotton fabric from Africa. Your company is on the map and you may not be able to hide anything anymore. So how do we manage this information and also use this as a great opportunity because now companies come to source map and say, please help us figure out where should we produce our product next time. So you as a customer, as stakeholders are happy and we minimize our footprint. So in that sense, um, to summarize, we're moving far away from the cost and much further towards opportunity. Or in other sense, it's not so much about the bolt-on approach, where we simply band-aid it, we bolt it on sustainability or social environmental performance or corporate social responsibility on top of existing situation, kind of took a product, band-aided it on top and say now we are responsible and sustainable. Instead of that, we are embedded in, into the DNA of the company, embedded into, into the DNA of a product, and really coming from inside out, where it is a definitional aspect of everything we do, and a normal business, another business as usual. So in that sense, we have to start as a summary, the biggest trend, we're moving away from bolt-on approaches, the band-aid approaches, to deep, deep embeddedness and coming to a completely different way. And in that way, we can therefore create value, not just for shareholders, which we're legally obliged to do, but also for stakeholders. Because most of us, our business is of course here, where there's value for shareholders, but actually loss of value for stakeholders. Some are here and they are rapidly moving towards bankruptcy. But we used to think that this is a good idea. Let's take some value from shareholders and donate it to stakeholders. But it's equally irresponsible and equally unsustainable. So we have to find a way to really create value for both shareholders and stakeholders, but not as a compromise, as a way that really mutually reinforces each other. So, what we often talk about in terms of sustainability, in order to embed sustainability, we have to think about value creation not only on these two low levels of risk management and efficiency, but also on much higher levels. This is about product creation, this is about markets, this is about brand, this is about changing the rules of the game, and the support of all of that. This is about radical innovation. But the opportunities for value creation are not just the slow levels, this is where you create very little value. The most interesting is change game changing and changing the largest level possible.